Hello Year 7 and welcome to the next video in our series of lessons based on Boy by Roald Dahl. Now as I mentioned in the last video, to, to do complete these lessons you will need your work booklet. So this work booklet is titled Lessons 4 to 6 and you will need a copy of Boy. So whether that's the physical copy of the book, the PDF copy you can find online or the audio book that is entirely up to you. Now today we are looking at chapter 3 from the novel. Um, chapter 3 is called The Sweet Shop and Mrs. Pratchett. So our learning objective is to explore the presentation of Mrs. Pratchett. You're going to read chapter three and then you're going to do some close analysis of um, a description of Mrs. Pratchett as well. So what we're going to do first of all is we're going to think again about morphology. So a few lessons ago we talked about morphology and etymology. Morphology being the study of parts of words and etymology meaning where words come from. So using morphology, which means to break words down into parts, I'd like you to define the following words. So you're just thinking about what those words mean. So what does the word geography mean? What does the word biology mean? What does the word bronchitis mean? What does the word bicycle mean? And and so on okay you can see that list there there are 10 of them in total now the first one's been done for you so geography meaning to study earth um, most of them are quite logical so last lesson we talked about what bio means we talked about what itis is you should be able to work out what most of them are you might even know obviously just what some of them are but I want you to try and break down the words so if you're thinking for example photography we looked at graphy meaning study um, meaning to write um, photography obviously you can decide what you think that might mean now you've got these written out in your work booklet so you can write down next to them what each of them are pause the video it will probably take you five minutes or so to write, work out what each of those things are now if you get stuck think about the part of the word so number 10 for example it's quite an easy one if you think about a submarine you might think oh I know what a submarine is but I don't know where the word parts come from think about other words that have those words in them so submarine subway sub I'm sure you can think of some other words that start with sub or that have sub in them yeah so think about that and then think about the next part so marine so if a subway or and a submarine they share that word at the beginning um marine and way what what does submarine what does it mean if it has that better part of sub at the beginning of that so i want you to see if you can work out what those 10 are pause, pause the video if you need to um and then continue and we'll go through the answers together okay so the answers are now on the slide so give yourself a ticker across if you got them right so um geography is the study of earth biology is the study of life Bronchitis is the lung inflammation and infection. So bronch is to do with your lungs and then itis meaning inflammation or infection. Um, bicycle it means two circles literally so by meaning two um, you know the word bicycle um, you might know the word bifocal meaning two lenses if you've got glasses um, bisexual meaning both sex both sexes and so um, the idea of bicycle meaning two circles you've got tonsillitis which is inflammation and infection of the tonsils automobile which means self-movement so an automobile is just a car um, so the idea of auto meaning self we looked at that last lesson when we looked at autobiography mobile meaning movement Okay. Photography is light writing, so the idea if you've put photo, study of photos, that would be right as well. You can give yourself a tick if you've got that. Television is distance vision. Photosynthesis meaning light fusion. Synthesis meaning fusion. F photo meaning light. And then submarine meaning under ocean or underwater. Okay. So that part of the word sub there means under. Okay. Now, if what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Mrs. Pratchett and we're going to be thinking about um, the morphology of words later on in the lesson as well. Okay, so what we're going to be thinking about now then is writer's methods. And you might be thinking, what is Miss talking about? What's a writer's methods? But when writers create a text, they use certain tools to create specific effects. Just like a builder, you need the right tool for the right job. So the proper name for these tools are writer's methods. And when you do a piece of writing yourself, most of the time, without even realising it, you use writer's methods to help you put your work together. You use tools like adjectives, verbs, similes and metaphors to help you create the best piece of writing that you possibly can. So what we're going to be doing today is reading chapter three and specifically looking at the description of Mrs. Pratchett and trying to figure out which writer's methods Roald Dahl has used for each part of his description. 
So in particular, we're going to be looking for these. We're going to be looking for alliteration, adjectives, sibilance, simile, and repetition. Now, some of those you might think, yep, I know what they are, and you'll be um, certain on those and you probably did them at primary school, and so you should be really clear on them. Others, maybe sibilance or similes, you might not be sure, and you might think, oh, I'm not quite sure what that one is. I've got a vague idea. If you don't know any of them, then it means that you need to do some revision because you should remember what an adjective is, for example, and you should know what repetition is. So I'm going to go through them very quickly now. If you're absolutely sure that you know what they mean, then you can pause the video, you can write them out in your work booklet, you can think about what the definitions are. If you're not really sure and you think, actually, I could do with Miss going over it and helping me out with those, then keep listening and I'll go through and describe each one. So alliteration. Alliteration is when you use sounds in a sentence that begin with the same letter or sound. So that the sound is repeated. So you might know the very famous one. Uh, I'm not very good at it. Peter Piper picked a piece of pickled pepper. OK, you might know that one. That's an example of alliteration. And you've got repetition there of the P sound. Now, sometimes writers use alliteration to emphasize how disgusting something is. So if you had like um, a bloody boil burst everywhere so you have that alliteration of the b sound there to make sure the boil sounds disgusting um writers use alliteration for many reasons but i want you to have a look later on in the lesson and see if you can pick out where Roldal has used alliteration and what he might be trying to achieve when he uses it to describe mrs pratchett Next, we have adjectives. Now, adjectives are used to modify or change a noun. OK, so if I had a noun like table, I might have the adjective big. I might have the adjective oak. I might have the adjective dirty or tatty. Um, so those adjectives describe the noun. OK, so adjectives are different to adverbs because adverbs describe verbs. Adjectives always describe a noun. So we're going to be looking for lots of adjectives to describe Mrs. Pratchett, Mrs. Pratchett being a lady, a woman. Um, and there are lots of adjectives to describe her in this extract that we're going to look at. Next, we have sibilance. Now, sibilance is a lot like alliteration, except sibilance is repetition of S sounds specifically. OK, so if you had um, she she sells seashells on the seashore, that is an example of sibilance because you're using S sounds specifically um, to create an effect. Now, usually S sounds or repetition of S sounds are used to suggest that something really isn't very nice. Sometimes we think about S sounds as being being kind of snake-like, so sounds, um, and they usually present something as being really not very nice, something to be scared of, which might be why when we read the chapter three and we think about Mrs. Pratchett, why Roald Dahl uses S sounds and sibilance in particular to describe Mrs. Pratchett. Now, similes, um, there are some people get confused between similes and metaphors, and they are quite similar, apart from similes are a little bit easier, in my opinion. So a simile is when you say that something is like something else. You're comparing it by saying that it's like that thing or it does something as quickly or as slowly or you use the word as as well. So if I said he ran like a cheetah, I'm comparing him to a cheetah by saying that he does something like a cheetah. If I said he ran as quick as a cheetah, I'm using the word as. So if you're not sure whether something's a simile or a metaphor, look out, see if you can spot the word like or as in the sentence. If it does it like something or as something, then it is a simile. Give you an example. So if I said, oh, my classroom is like a circus, I would be saying that my classroom is noisy, it's busy, there's lots going on. If I said my classroom is a circus, then I'm using a metaphor. So you can see the difference there. It's very subtle. But if I said it's like a circus, that's a simile. If I said it is a circus, that's a metaphor. Last but not least, we have repetition. Now, repetition is when you use the same sentence or phrase or idea more than once. So any you can repeat something just by using it twice um, or you could use it three or four times. So repetition is when you repeat something, when you use it more than once. There might be a particular word in this extract that we're going to look at that uses repetition and describes Mrs. Pratchett in the same way over and over again. So we're going to move on. We're going to have a look at chapter three. Don't forget you need your physical copy of Boy, whether that's the book copy or whether it is a um, the audio book or whether it's the PDF that you can find online. Right. What I would like you to do now then is read chapter three, The Sweet Shop and Mrs. Pratchett. Now, if you have got your own copy and you're allowed, feel free to underline or highlight any particularly effective description of Mrs. Pratchett. If you don't have your own copy, that's fine, but you're just going to want you to think about what 
um, how Mrs. Pratchett is presented by Roald Dahl in this extract. So read the whole of chapter three, pause the video, and then um, well, you can resume it up when you finish reading. Now, in my copy, um, which is um, the one that the PowerPoint slides, the description, the background, sorry, is based on my copy. We're looking at page 33, but don't worry too much if you haven't got a copy because the extract that we're going to be looking at in particular is in your work booklet. So flick to the end of this lesson, the end of lesson four, and it tells you in that, um, it's got the extract in that lesson so you can annotate on that one. So you don't have to write in your copy of the book. So what I would like you to think about is alliteration, adjectives, sibilance and simile and repetition. Now, if you've got five colours, you could do a little key and you could see which ones you can highlight and which ones you can find. I want you to find as many examples as possible of those five techniques. So you'll notice the description of Mrs Pratchett is really a foul, very disgusting, gross one. So how do you know how Roald Dahl feels about Mrs Pratchett or how he felt about her when he was a child? So I want you to look for those things, look for alliteration, look for adjectives, look for sibilance, simile and repetition. And then as a little challenge or extension task for you, if you can, see if you can spot any other techniques. Okay? Can you find any superlative adjectives? When you've done that, we're going to move on. But I want you to pause the video now and try and have a look for those five techniques in the extract that's in your workbooklet. Now, when you've done that, we're going to be having a go at this question. How does Roald Dahl use language to make Mrs. Pratchett sound unpleasant? I think unpleasant seems like a little bit of an understatement based on how gross she sounds in the extract. But for the sake of this question, I want you to see if you can find evidence that suggests that Mrs. Pratchett is presented as being unpleasant. Now, you could start with the phrase that's on the slide there and it's also in your work booklet. But I want you to try and elaborate on that in as much detail as you possibly can. So the writer uses blank in the phrase and then your quotation to make Mrs. Pratchett sound unpleasant. So you're going to say the writer uses and then which technique, which writer's method does he use? Maybe you could put repetition in there. Maybe you could put sibilance. Maybe you could put um, a simile in the phrase. And then you're going to put the quotation in. Now make sure you use quotation marks. Make sure that you copy it exactly as it is from the book. And then you're going to finish that sentence to make Mrs. Pratchett sound unpleasant. Now, what you could do if you want to elaborate your answer even more, which is what we're aiming for, is think about what effects that has on the reader. What, how does the reader feel about Mrs. Pratchett? How might the reader feel about Roald? Maybe the reader thinks that Roald is um, being a little bit unfair on Mrs. Pratchett. You can decide. But I want you to think, how does that phrase or the quotation that you've chosen, how does that present Mrs. Pratchett as being really unpleasant, really disgusting? Now, this should take you a little bit of time. It should take you at least 10 minutes if you're going to do it properly. Um, if you think you're ready to move on, then you can carry on. But for the time being, pause the video, use the sentence starters to help you and finish that sentence. Don't forget to use your annotations as well, your quotations that you picked out earlier and the techniques that you've picked out. Why has Roald Dahl used that particular writer's method and what is he trying to achieve in that quotation? Now, you've written a few sentences, maybe even a couple of paragraphs. I would like you to now use the self-assessment that's in your work booklet and see kind of what, what went well and even better if you would give yourself. So if you have used all of these things, then one of your what went well is could your what went well could be that you have used all of the criteria that you're expected to. If you've missed out one of them, maybe, then that could be your even better if. So have you used terminology? Now, English teachers, when we say the word terminology, what we mean is writer's methods, um, similes, metaphors, adjectives, adverbs, um, thinking about the quotations that you've been used. So terminology is all those fancy Englishy words that you're trying to use, like all the writer's methods that I listed earlier. Have you copied an accurate quotation? Have you zoomed in, zoomed in on a key word? Now, you might have remembered a te one of your English teachers saying, talking about single word analysis in your lessons earlier this year. So single word analysis is when you um, zoom in on one word in particular. So I know for a fact in the in that extract, we had the repetition of the word disgusting. So that's the repetition of an adjective there. So you could say the adjective disgusting is repeated because Roll wants to emphasise just how vile and loathsome Mrs Pratchett really is. It's not just one thing that's disgusting about her, it's everything. It's this, it's that, it's this. And over and over, he uses that word to really emphasise how disgusting she is. So that would be a good example of single word analysis. And then if you wanted to take that one step further, you could look at more than one keyword 
word. So you could write a few sentences about that word disgusting, but then you could write another sentence about that word foul. What does that word foul suggest about her? You could think about the fact that he uses different senses to describe her. What does she look like? But what does she smell like? And what does she sound like as well? Now, the next one, gone beyond surface meanings. Now, that sounds like it's quite complicated, but it basically means, have you looked beyond what's obvious? I'll give you an example. Quite often, um, say if we had the quotation, he was sad. I've had students in the past, right? Um, this quotation shows that he was sad because it uses the word sad. Now, that is just the very obvious, straightforward meaning. So you think beyond that. If you had the sentence, it, he was sad, you could suggest think about why he was sad. Why, why might have the writer used the word sad? Why didn't the writer use the word traumatised? What does the word sad suggest about his feelings and how he feels about life? So you need to go beyond what's obvious. And the last but not least, have you answered the question? And that seems really straightforward, but so many times students will start talking about something that's not exactly relevant and then think, oh, no, I have to start again because I haven't actually answered the question. So don't forget, the question was, how does Raul Dahl use language to describe Mrs. Pratchett and make Mrs. Pratchett seem unpleasant? So make sure you answer that question. Think about where can you tell that she's unpleasant based on the extract that you've been given. Now, if you've done all that, make sure you give yourself a what went well and an even better if as well. And when we've done that, you've finished the lesson four, so you can either pause the video now and then come back to it another day, or you can continue with lesson five. Hello, Year 7. So we're starting lesson five now from your boy Roald Dahl unit. Now, this lesson is the Mindful Sweetie Challenge, and this has to be the best lesson from the whole scheme of work, from all of the lessons that you're going to do this year, because this lesson involves eating sweets. So our learning objective is to describe the experience of eating a sweet using all of your senses. So you can't doesn't get much better than this. You need sweets for this lesson. I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a second as to why and what sweets you need. Now, um, you will need your workbook for this lesson um, so you need to make sure that you've got that to hand um, you're doing lesson five and there'll be a planning sheet in there that you're going to use throughout the lesson as well so for this lesson you will need to ask someone at home very very politely for a sweet of some sort and our hard-boiled sweet is ideal and that would be like a lemon sherbet um, that might be a mint humbug, anything that you've got, like a hard boiled sweet is ideal. But if you don't have a hard boiled sweet, then any sweets that you've got lying around the house will be fine. Now, if you do not have any sweets, that's absolutely fine as well. You will have to use your imagination. So, like I said, ideal if you've got a sweet, but if you haven't, I'm sure you've had plenty of sweets in the past. You can use your imagination here. Now, it will be your mission to write a multi-sensory description of what your experience of eating this sweet is. Now, using morphology, you can probably work out what multi-sensory multi means. Multi meaning more than one, sensory meaning your senses. So you're going to use more than one sense here to describe what your experience of eating a sweet is. If you do not have a real if you do have a real sweet to help you, you will have to exercise a lot of willpower here not to just gobble up your sweet in one go. So you're trying to think about each stage of eating the sweet. So what does it smell like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? What can you hear, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I want you to have a think about that. Um, like I said, you try not to eat your sweet in one go really, really quickly. It's better to save it and then you can have as many as you want after the lesson. Using your planning sheet in your um, work booklet, I would like you to begin by imagining a jar of different coloured sweets. Okay, and there's a little picture of one on the board for you, but I want you to use your imagination. And if you need to at this point, you could pause the video, Google jars of sweets and then see what comes up. You're going to use the first sense on your planning sheet, and that is your sense of sight. So I would like you to pause the video. But before you do that, I want you to come up with one complex sentence to describe the jar. So you might remember from primary school, a complex sentence is a sentence sentence that has more than one clause and a simile to describe the appearance of the sweets. So I need to think about how could you describe the jar of sweets using both a complex sentence and also a simile. And you'll remember from last lesson what a simile is when you compare something using like or as. So how big is the jar of sweets, for example? What are the colours like in the jar of sweets? Um, I'll give you one for free. You could say like a rainbow, the colours mixed together or the colours um, filled the jar, something like that. OK, so I want you to think about what sweets are in the jar even. Maybe um, they, what are your favourite sweets? Um, I think you could just imagine there's lots of different coloured bonbons, for example. So I want you to use your sense of sight to think about at least a complex sentence to describe the jar and a simile to describe the appearance of the sweets. Now, 
you either need to imagine what sweets smell like or if you have got a sweet in front of you you need to have a good whiff of it so you need to smell it and see if you can figure out how you would describe the smell so don't eat it just yet you're thinking about your sense of smell at this point so on your planning sheet i'd like you to write down three words that come to mind when you smell the sweet so um maybe it's it's a delicious smell maybe it's a sickly smell maybe it smells of sugar you could use the word intoxicating maybe it's a, it's a good piece of vocabulary there for you maybe the smell has got you in a trance it's hypnotized you is it what you are expecting is it a nice smell see we might be surprised maybe it's not really the smell that you expected maybe if it's the smell of chocolate it's a familiar smell to you and then i'd like you to think about what flavors you can recognize so you could say um i smell the sickly sweet strawberry stench or something like that okay so think about what flavors you can recognize so pause the video here and then think about your sense of smell now you need to imagine yourself in front of a bus inside a bustling sweet shop at 4 p.m bustling meaning very busy imagine that it's filled to the brim with children desperate to get their favorite goodies so obviously it'd be really difficult for you to describe what you can hear just by looking at your sweet because it doesn't make any noise if it's just in front of you so i want you to imagine you're in a sweet shop okay you're in a really busy sweet shop like maybe like the one from boy that is owned by mrs pratchett I'd like you to write down on your planning sheet a simile to describe the sound of the children in the shop. What do they sound like? What do the children all sound like when they're all in the shop together? It's very busy. They're all desperate to get their sweets. They've had a hard day at school. They need a little bit of um, joy in their lives and they're expecting that from the sweets that they're about to buy. And then I'd like you to write a sentence that starts with a verb to describe the sounds the children are making. So maybe you could have giggling, um, the girls grappled around the shopkeeper maybe you could have screaming the boys um, demanded their sweets so I think just start your sentence with a verb what are they doing what sounds are they making okay so pause the video here and then use your planning sheet and write down what you can hear inside a sweet shop at 4 p.m how would you describe the children that are desperate to buy all their sweets now unfortunately we don't have many um traditional sweet shops in wiltshire um those of you that have been on holiday maybe to quite touristy places like devon or cornwall you might have memories of a particular sweet shop that you've been in so sweet shops in wiltshire are um far and few between but you might have a very good memory of being inside a sweet shop. What did it look like? How were the children behaving? How did you feel when you were inside? Okay, now I want you to hold your sweet. So would you know what it is if you couldn't see it? Would it be a familiar feeling to you to have that sweet in your hand? So I want you to touch it. And if you haven't got one again, you're going to have to imagine it, depending on which, which sweet you're choosing. I want you to touch your sweet. So how heavy is the sweet and what textures can you feel? Now, if you've got a Harry Tang plastic, for example, you might describe it as being quite gritty. Maybe the sugar on it is quite um, gritty. But if you've got a bonbon, as I mentioned earlier, it might be quite a powdery feel. So I want you to think what textures can you feel when you hold that sweet? And if you closed your eyes, what does it feel a bit like? So try and think about something that you could compare it to by using a simile. Is it heavy? Is it light? Maybe it feels like a, a toy. Maybe it doesn't feel like anything that you've felt before. Maybe it's very familiar feeling to you. So I want you to imagine, shut your eyes, what, what could you compare the, the feeling of this sweet to in your hand? Okay, and this is the bit that you've been waiting for. Finally, you can put your sweet into your mouth or imagine that you're going to do so. So like I said, if you don't have any sweets with you, that's absolutely fine. But if you do, then I want you to put that sweet into your mouth and I want you to think about what it tastes like. And you've got your planning sheet in front of you. Is your sweet smooth or sticky? So again, if it's chocolate, it might be quite smooth. Maybe if, if you've got some toffee or some caramel, it might be quite um, hard to chew on. What flavours can you taste? Are they strong? Are they subtle? And again, yeah, it really depends on what sweet you've got. And do you like your sweet or would you rather have had a different one is it your favorite sweet that you've got is it could you imagine any anything better than that sweet so like i said if you haven't got one that's fine what could you um, could you imagine the best sweets in the world what are your favorite sweets in the world what would what, how would you describe them what would they be okay maybe you you, you could imagine because we're going to be doing a piece of writing later this lesson imagine that you've just bought some sweets because they're new and you want to try them you've bought them they're not as good as you thought they were going to be so you're going to have to go back into the shop and buy your your favorites that you usually buy okay so using your planning sheet there fill out how would you describe the taste of the sweet 
you might recognize the slide as being very similar to the writing challenges that you did um, earlier in the year because, because your next task is to write a sensory description of eating a sweet. Now this task needs to be sent to your English teacher because feedback will be provided by your English teacher on this task. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you give this a real good go and you think very carefully about how you're going to produce the best piece of work that you can. So as I said earlier, you might imagine yourself, you've just finished school, you've gone into a sweet shop, think about what it sounds like, what it smells like, how noisy it is, um, how busy it is. Maybe you leave the sweet shop, you're out in the street and then you start eating your sweets. What does it feel like? Maybe you're not allowed a sweet. Maybe you're thinking, oh, I really, really want one. There are some in the cupboard downstairs. I'm not allowed them. I'm going to try and sneak one and describe the way that it feels when you sneak it. And I'm sure, sure some of you recognise my description there as being very similar to chocolate cake by Michael Rosen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you have to go on YouTube and have a look for it. But Chocolate Cake by Michael Rosen is a very funny poem um, in which Michael Rosen describes when he was younger and he goes downstairs and he um, steals some chocolate cake. And the feeling that he experienced as he was remembering what that chocolate cake tasted like. So maybe you could have, write something similar to that and think about your favourite sweets in the cupboard that you're not allowed to have. Or maybe you're going to steal your siblings' sweets. And how does it feel when you pop one in your mouth finally? Um, how could you describe the taste and what it feels like? So when you've done this piece of work, you need to email it or send it in some way to your English teacher. You could attach it by show my homework. I would suggest email is the best way. Um, and if you're not sure how to email it, um, then that's something you need to have a think about. So go on, to, you can go into emails. That email address would be their um, surname followed by the first initial of the first name at bradenforest.wilts.sch.uk. So instructions for that will be on show my homework. Now, um, as I said, you're writing a sensory description of eating a sweet. Um, like I said, it, the main part of it is going to be you actually experiencing what it feels like to eat a sweet, but you might need to introduce it in some way by having the small part before, like about being in the sweet shop or sneaking a sweet when you were not allowed one, maybe stealing one from your brother or sister. And we're going to be checking as English teachers to make sure that you're using as many of these techniques as you can see um, on that list, making sure that you apply them and um, try and include as many as you can. So have you used the five senses? Have you used that complex sentence that you planned earlier? Have you used the simile? Have you used alliteration? Have you used the rule of three, exaggeration and an exclamation mark? So what you could do is you could tick them off as you use these or try and use each one three times maybe. And I want you to tick them off each time you do one. Now, ideally you're aiming to write at least a page. So I don't want you to rush it. I want you to take your time with this. It seems like quite a simple idea. You're just eating a sweet, I want you to build it up. How can you be as descriptive as possible? And there's also some vocabulary on here for you to try and do as try and include as well. So the word confectionery. So instead of repeating the word sweets over and over again, you could refer to it as confectionery. So confectionery is the collective name given to sweets and chocolate. So maybe you could describe entering the sweet shop and being surrounded by a sea of confectionery. Okay, that's a good one for you. Um, you could use the word appetite. So appetite is the desire to eat food. Will one sweet satisfy your appetite? So maybe if you've had your sweet um and you um have you finished it are you going to be happy with just one are you going to have to go back for more and then the word crinkle which is a crease or wrinkle in the material or the sound of a wrapper maybe you're opening your crinkling the wrapper as you open the wrapper you can hear it crinkle therefore that's your sense of hearing and there um and then you pop the sweet into your mouth um as quickly as you can so you're going to have to pause the video, use this slide to help you, um, use your planning sheet as well, especially, and you're going to produce a description of eating a sweet. Now, you need to make sure that you send that to your English teacher. They will be checking. I don't want to have to see any English teacher sending emails home to remind you that you haven't handed it in. Um, and then it would be lovely to read some of these and then we can share the really best ones. And you never know, some of the really good ones might um, be worthy of a head teacher's award as well. So try it your hardest. Um, it definitely should take you more than um, 20 minutes. I'm thinking maybe half an hour to 40 minutes on this should take you. Um, and most importantly, edit your work, proofread your work, see if you can go through and make it as best as you possibly can, as good as you possibly can. Okay, then when you've done that and you've finished your sensory description, I would like you to try and self-assess it. So maybe you can do it on the, co not on the copy that you sent to your teacher, but on a different copy of it. You could copy and paste it or you could um, annotate over it and then send it to your teacher before you do that. But I want you to try and have a look for the techniques that you've included. So highlight and label all the methods that you've used. There are... 
seven of them sorry it's just counting seven of them on there maybe you could use seven colors to label them i want you to circle any errors you can find i mean you could even get an older brother or sister to do that for you if you've got one at home um circle any errors that you can find your spelling mistakes give what went well comment and even better if comment and sign and date your work to say that it has been self-assessed okay so it's really important there that you edit your work and proofread it as well. Now, when you've done that, as I said earlier, make sure, please, that you email it to your English users so that it can give you some feedback and it would be lovely to hear from you as well. OK, now what we did in the first part of the lesson is actually called mindfulness. Now, quite often we, especially with sweets, um, we just want to rush through them, get them all down quickly as we can because they're just so delicious. But with a lot of things in life, taking things slowly and taking your time to do it can mean that we get more out of it. So mindfulness is very good for your mental health. It's characterised by noticing the world around us. So rather than just going for a walk, thinking about your senses as you're going for the walk, what can you see? What can you hear? What can you smell? What does the air taste like, exam for example? So so modern life is very fast and I think that whilst we've all been at home some of us have realised I definitely have that sometimes it's worth taking your time with things maybe it's worth um, taking in the world around you so slow down eat a sweet and try and be more mindful about what's happening okay so we have the last lesson of this video and this lesson we are going to be looking at confectionery poetry so we've already looked at one poem we um, have looked at midterm break um, by Seamus Heaney in this lesson we're going to look at a couple more poems so our learning objective it's quite a funny one is to fully appreciate confectionery in all of its forms now last lesson I told you that confectionery is the collective name given to sweets and chocolate so we're going to be looking at lots of confectionery and we're going to start the lesson with something that I think is quite a fun and that is 10 minutes of free writing. So you can write any way that you want. You can write about um, in any form that you want, any narrative that you want, from any perspective that you want. And I'd like you to use one of the following three images as inspiration. So you've got them in your work booklet. If you go to time to lesson six and you can see there's a picture of the donuts, there's a picture of um, the tarts and the desserts on the counter. And there's also lots and lots of sweets in that picture. So you've got 10 minutes. And if you've got a timer, maybe you can use your phone or you can set a timer on the laptop on your laptop or computer then I want you to think about writing just for 10 minutes how much can you get done what, what can you describe in these pictures um if you want more than 10 minutes obviously I'm not going to complain and tell you off but um what you could do always do is to give yourself 10 minutes to plan and then 10 minutes to write so you could do a 10 minute mind map on one of those pictures think about everything that you could describe and think about your senses what's it look like what's it smell like what's it taste like um and then you could do 10 minutes of writing so it's up to you I don't want you to spend ages on it um, because this piece of work isn't going to be marked it's just a bit of fun have a think how could you describe what you can see in one of those pictures so pause the video give yourself 10 minutes maybe a little bit longer if you need it describe what you can see do some free writing based on these pictures okay now that you've done that I'd like you to have a think about this poem and hopefully you recognise this man. His name is Michael Rosen. He writes some very funny poetry. And in this lesson, you're going to be having a look at Chocolate Cake um, by Michael Rosen in particular. And I mentioned it last lesson, but just to get you thinking about it, you can, if you search for his name on YouTube, Michael Rosen Chocolate Cake, you'll find it. And I'm sure most of you have seen it before. You've seen the memes about Michael Rosen um, and about the um, his um poems um but just in case you haven't then find the, vi the video on youtube and listen to it and i want you to count can you see how many times michael rosen specifically says those words chocolate cake because chocolate cake obviously is a form of confectionery and therefore by watching this video we're meeting our learning objective so watch the video see if you can make a note of how many times michael rosen says the words chocolate cake in this video his face is making me laugh when I look at the picture. Okay. Um, now, when you've done that, we're going to have you having a look at a different poem. So we're going to be looking at a poem called um, Mr. Biscuit. Okay. Now, this poem is about confectionery as well. And you're going to be reading the poem and it's been printed in your work booklet. So you can have a look in there and um, see if you can um, find as many types of biscuits as possible in this poem so if you've got a highlighter or you can use a pencil highlight all of the biscuits mentioned in the poem Mr Biscuit and I'm going to read it to you as well so Mr Biscuit by Philip Gross it's not that he can't afford the best crisp de crisp edge in cris crisp dark boxes but he buys them specially misshapes broken moves of gingers dust speckled jacoffa cakes stumps of chocolate fingers unstuck custard creams the last line of a ruined bourbons jammy dodgers past their prime 
Take he, he spreads them on a little silver dish when he invites you back to tea. A biscuit priest while you stare at them. A puzzle with some pieces missing. A map of the world with the continents drifting apart. And the clock ticking hush somehow. But how? You have to choose. Okay, so that's the poem, Mr. Biscuit. Um, now, hopefully you've managed to spot quite a few different types of biscuits yourself. Um, there are definitely many, many biscuits listed in here and you might not have been able to work it out. So I'll just explain really quickly. This poem is about a man um, who's referred to as Mr. Biscuit who buys, and you might have seen them um, in some shops, when instead of buying packets of individual types of biscuits, you can buy a big box of all of the biscuits that have been a bit battered and a bit broken in the factory. So in some shops, you can buy a biscuit assortment and they're all of the biscuits that weren't quite perfect enough to be put in a packet of their own and so they've all been mushed together and uh, the narrator describes going to Mr Biscuit's house and seeing the biscuits that have been put on a little silver dish for you when you go there for tea and not being able to choose because they all look so delicious okay how are you supposed to choose with all of these amazing biscuits that he's listed so again we've got a poem that talks about confectionery and talks about how wonderful confectionery is you're going to be writing your own poem about confectionery and you've got lots of options on here so you're going to have to pause the slide very shortly and think about what type of poem you'd like to write so you could write an acrostic poem now many of you will remember acrostic poems from um, primary school an acrostic poem is when you write down a word at the side of your page and then for each letter you write a sentence or a line that starts with that letter so you could have the word sweeties for example and you would your first line would start with an s and then a w then an e and so on so you could or you could have donuts and then you'd write donuts on the side of your page and then you'd write your poem about donuts now i will say that's probably the easiest option on here so if you want to try and challenge yourself think about some of the others but if you're like nope i'm not very good at poetry i don't even want to try then you can pause the video now and start writing an acrostic. Now, if you're still with me, then I'm pleased that you're willing to listen and find out a little bit more about some of the other poem types and you'll want to try and challenge yourself. So you could try and write a performance poem like Chocolate Cake. So um, performance poetry, it's the clues in the name. It's a poem that's designed to be performed. So when Michael Rosen writes Chocolate Cake, um, if you look at it on paper, it's not as funny as hearing him read it out and doing all the voices and doing um, all the sounds and things like that. So you could write a piece of performance poetry. You could adapt your free writing from the beginning of the lesson. So the 10 minutes that you gave yourself at the beginning, you could adapt that and turn it into a poem. You could write Mr. Biscuit, but you could change it to be about sweet. So you could use that to help you. And maybe you could talk about entering a sweet shop. How are you supposed to choose when all of these incredible, amazing sweets are all on all the shelves? You could change the words of a well-known nursery rhyme or song. Maybe there's a song that you really like and that you love listening to. And you could change the lyrics to make it about um, a nursery rhyme or a song. And I've seen lots of, um, on TikTok in particular, lots of uh, songs that have been changed to, to, to have a different meaning. So maybe you could think about that. Is there a song that you could write and you um, could change the lyrics so that it's about sweets or about donuts or about chocolate or whatever you like? And then the hardest one on here, but one that you could absolutely have a go at if you really want to challenge yourself, would be a ballad about sweets. Now, you might think, what the heck is a ballad? What's most talking about? But a ballad is a poem that tells a story. So a traditional ballad stanza has four lines. So, and the key is that the second and the fourth lines rhyme. OK, so a ballad is a story. So maybe you could talk, write a, a story um, and turn it into a poem or you could write your poem as a story. So you're telling and there's a, a narrative there. So maybe it's a journey that you go on to find some sweets. Maybe you're stealing some sweets from somebody. and You don't want them to find out about it. So the traditional ballad stanza consists of four lines and the key is that the second and fourth lines rhyme. So you could pause this video, have this slide open, have your copy of Mr Biscuit in front of you as well and also your free writing from earlier and then I'd like you to have a go at writing a poem about confectionery. So it could be sweets, chocolates, donuts, candy, anything that you like.